Have good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum for this wonderful evening program sponsored by the National Air and Space Society of which all of you are members or guests. So please give yourself a round of applause. My name is Roger Lanius. I'm uh, the Associate Director for Collections and Curatorial Affairs here at the museum and it's my pleasure to welcome you here. I hope you enjoy your night at the museum. Uh, my task is very simple this evening. It is to bring to the podium Valerie Neal, who's the chair of the Space History Division here at the museum, who will host this evening and uh, keep order among the astronauts who are going to be speaking to you. You will most assuredly enjoy this particular evening. So Valerie, please come forward. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to see many of you again and to meet some of you for the first time. Our spring program for the National Air and Space Society uh, this year is focused on a theme that we have carried throughout our lectures and our exhibitions this year. Uh, we are focusing on the 50th anniversary or 50 years of extravehicular activity. Uh, it has been 50 years, believe it or not, since Alexei Leonov ventured out and also since Ed White ventured out uh, to take those first uh, high-risk uh, spacewalks into the unknown. Uh, in celebration of that, we have a special exhibition on the second floor called Outside the Spacecraft and a wonderful website if you'd like to explore that. And so we decided to invite tonight three speakers from across the shuttle era who are record-setting spacewalkers in their own right. Uh, they are U.S. record holders and spacewalkers par excellence. Combined, these three people have 145 hours outside their spacecraft. That's three and a half weeks total. Uh, think of that. In addition, they all flew at least one mission on Discovery, and today is the third anniversary of Discovery coming to the National Air and Space Museum. So that was one criterion by which we selected you as well. Um, Discovery astronauts are always at home here. Uh, I can't do justice to their accomplishments in about a minute each, but I'm going to try. And uh, you have some additional information in the invitation and program. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce the legendary Dr. Story Musgrave, MD, who served for more than 30 years as an astronaut. He entered the astronaut corps in 1967, before the landings on the moon. And he left the astronaut corps in the mid to late 1990s. Um, he s flew six times on a great variety of missions. And he had, before he flew on the shuttle, he had experience in Skylab and in developing all the tools and equipment and procedures and even scenarios for extravehicular activity on the shuttle. So you might say he was there at the beginning of spacewalking in the shuttle era and it bears his stamp um, ever since then. He performed the first spacewalk which was done on Challenger's first mission in 1983. Uh, his last spacewalks were in 1996, or his last mission, I should say, it didn't have a spacewalk on the 96th mission. Uh, altogether, he spent 53 days in space, uh, seven and a half weeks in all, uh, to be envied, uh, 26 and a half hours outside in EVA. And on top of all of that uh, daring do in space, he is an avid soaring enthusiast, an avid scuba diver, uh, an avid parachutist with hundreds of free falls, and he also spends a lot of time uh, speaking around the country and probably around the world. So uh, welcome to our podium tonight. And he has seven kids. And he has seven children. <laughs> <laughs> the oldest is 55, 
and the youngest is eight. Okay. Oh, my. The oldest is 55 and the youngest is eight years old. I don't know when he's had time to do all that. Do you? <laughs> Our second uh, speaker is Captain Michael Lopez Alegria. I, I should have mentioned actually that the story was in the U.S. Marine Corps and also uh, in the Air Force uh, test pilot schools. Uh, Michael Lopez Alegria is a U.S. naval aviator and uh, he flew with the Navy in the 1980s and then came into the Astronaut Corps in 1992. Uh, he flew four missions in uh, fairly rapid succession uh, from 1995 through 2006 and 7. Uh, three of those were shuttle missions and one of them was an expedition on the International Space Station. Uh, his record in space is 257 days, uh, about 37 weeks, and he has um, uh, 67 hours, almost 68 hours of EVA. Uh, so think of that as a work week and a half. Uh, how many of us would love to spend that much time uh, spacewalking? Uh, he was the commander of the Expedition 14 on the International Space Station and a member of his crew was Sonny Williams and they did spacewalks together on that mission uh, on the International Space Station. And uh, he's now working here in Washington uh, very much involved in commercial space flight and the future of space flight. Uh, Sunny Williams, also a naval aviator. Her specialty is rotary wing aircraft, uh, of which she's flown very many. Uh, she has also done an underwater mission in the NASA NEMO uh, facility, uh, getting prepared for her two expeditions on the International Space Station. Uh, the first one, she was flight engineer. The second one, she was commander. And uh, to date, there have been only two female commanders, I believe. Uh, she was one of those. Um, she has uh, altogether uh, 50 hours and 40 minutes EVA. She's the world record holder for women. And uh, Michael Lopez Alegria is the U.S. record holder for men uh, for duration and number of EVAs. Some of you may have seen Sunny's tour of the International Space Station on the web. Uh, it was a great tour. She makes you feel right at home there. And uh, I think it's the best way to learn about how people are living up there right now. Uh, Sunny is still on active duty, and uh, I hope that you have a chance to fly again. You probably can't get enough of it, right? That's awesome. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming all three of our speakers. Each one is going to speak for a few minutes from his or her own perspective on extravehicular activity. Then we're going to have a little bit of conversation among ourselves and then conversation with the audience. So be thinking of your questions as we proceed. And Story, we will start with you. Okay, you got the challenge on me, right? 10 minutes, 258 slides. We got to get through it. It's going to be a motion picture. Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it in 10 minutes. You told me I couldn't, but here we go. Okay, Bruce McCandless, first flight of the MMU, and I like the kind of picture because I can do the light uh, alphabet up there and down here. So I'm going to show you some of the major milestones in spacewalking that took us along the way. Major milestones that increased the state of the art, critical things along the way to lead up to these two champions over here, LA and Sunny. Okay, we are celebrating the 50th anniversary of spacewalking. Here's Alex Leonov, an incredible great guy and artist. I had the privilege of um, uh, getting to know him because on Apollo Soyuz test project, his office was right next to mine in the old building four. And so we're celebrating the 50th anniversary. It's one of the major reasons we are here uh, tonight. <clears throat> and so then we move on to Ed White in the Gemini program at 12 minutes. Just get out there and see how stuff works on an umbilical. The Gemini EVAs did not go well because we weren't used to the free fall zero-g condition. 
in which you exercise a certain force here on an object, the force comes back to you. So it's action and reaction. The first Gemini spacewalks did not go well. But we did get into water and we took on that physics right away. <clears throat> and Werner von Braun, an incredible visionary, a science fiction kind of person, he understood that we had to have water. So we built three facilities at Huntsville, Alabama, ended up with a National Buoyancy Simulator Lab, and you couldn't stop this guy. Uh, so there was no money to do this thing, but he built it anyway. He got a severe reprimand from the GAO for his creative financing, and we all celebrated that. Yes, man, if you want to go somewhere, he's the guy. And I took a dive with him, an incredible privilege. One of the, maybe the best things I did in space was to take a dive with him in 1968. So I did help the Apollo crews that they're incredibly busy and I did the vacuum chamber checks on Apollo at K Kennedy Space Center. Joe Schmidt here, a classic forever, our suit tech. So away we go into the Apollo program. One of the great missions was Apollo 9 in which we flew the Apollo and we flew the LEM together and we did spacewalks out of Apollo and out of the LEM and we separated rendezvous so away we go. You know about the massive success of spacewalking <clears throat> in the Apollo program. Then we went into Skylab, the first space station. The Skylab lost its meteoroid shield on launch. It lost a solar panel on launch. This solar panel did not deploy. We're stuck. We're only 40% of the power, and we had to face the sun to get as much power as we could, but we were cooking. There was no shield, and we were 126 Fahrenheit. We're about to lose the space station. We went to the hardware store, and I ain't kidding you. We went to the hardware store, and we bought in Sears every possible tool we could, and we stuffed it in an Apollo, <clears throat> and away we went. We tried to release. That solar panel was stuck down there. We tried to release it with the Apollo spacewalk, the Apollo capsule flying around here, and Whites was leaning out of the door with his toe stuck in a couch trying to get the job done and trying to get that released. And we are notorious for that flight. As the media said, this is the worst stream of profanity to ever come down to Earth from space flight. And nobody complained. I think we still hold the record. He didn't get the panel out, but Kerwin and Whites later on were able to get that. We saved. This was done on the second Skylab that to shield that from the sun. <clears throat> and so Skylab was there. We did do ICAPCOM, a seven as a backup on, and ICAPCOM seven of those missions. Uh, so away we go. I did some contingency stuff to onto the shuttle program. So developing the shuttle program, this is my A7LB from Skylab. That we want to do three things. That zipper is a three foot zipper that wraps around here to your back. That is a three foot zipper, and it is a zipper. It works like a zipper like this. It holds two rubber things together. Believe me, folks, when you got a three-foot zipper, it's between you and eternity. You think about the next design, you want to do away with the zipper. So we did away with the zipper, <clears throat> and we integrated, instead of wrapping, uh, instead of wrapping hoses around to the front here, we integrate the hut. And so that's what we did, and I wanted to create perfect glove. I wanted to have a glove which incorporated this joint, Sonny, this joint right here. We never got there. Yeah. <laughs> what I, I didn't get that done. <clears throat> so, but anyway, so the development, and the development I did for most of the shuttle program was in a water tank that was next to the gym, 260, uh, 260A. So we still did not have a water tank. We ended up re uh, repurposing the centrifuge building. That's the way we were able to afford to get some water there. This is the old days, folks. Man, I wish I looked like that today. <laughs> At least at one time in life I did look like that. <laughs> So, but I'm seeing that the life support system supports us in the way it needs. The backpack that you wear, it's your physiology, so away we go. That's a zero-G airplane looking at Don and Dolphin. So the, ninth, the Hubble Space Telescope I picked up in 1975. They told me, look after that machine, identify every possible failure, and come up with a spacewalking tools and procedures to fix it. So I started in 1975. Uh, this is an artist concept, so I'm dealing with anything I can. Artist conflict, putting in the wide field planetary camp, I'm trying to get physical. So I didn't have anything to play with, but we got a balloon telescope there, and so, and this high fidelity robotic arm was not human qualified, so we put a balloon on it. So that's a balloon story, Musgrave, you're looking at right there. Okay, that's the way we all got to work, folks. It's not got the same body you got that suit. It's very bulky, and it's got very mass. So you got to move that mass around. That's the way we got to work, design the telescope. 
So Challenger's first fly, I did get a first shuttle spacewalk, and this is a crew for Challenger. Now way back early then, we didn't have STS numbers. We didn't know what STS number would be assigned to, so we were letters. So we were F, so we were crew F. Well, we call ourselves F Troop, so we had to come up with our own photograph, so <clears throat> that's that one there. So I did, unfortunately, get to do the first shuttle spacewalk because I had worked for 12 years designing the spacesuit and all the contingency procedures like that. This is tether dynamics. I was studying if you ever get lost and on that tether, can you pull yourself back to the anchor point? But mostly on SDS-6, all I did was check out that life support system to see that it will get you what it got to get you and played with tools like winches come along and that kind of stuff. Uh, for the first time, we did a cold spacewalk. We were not used to cold. This was a cold spacewalk. All the spacewalks prior to this were warm. So the Hubble Space Telescope, when I got the real thing, I removed every single component and installed them back in the real telescope. I also participated in things like this, like Intel Intelsat a repair mission to put a new motor on it. The motor had failed. I had a robotic arm, and that stuff did not work. So I came up with a procedure for three people to grab 18,000 pounds. Uh, people told my nuts, but it worked. So that's that. I did the solar max too. Hubble Space Telescope, and we are celebrating now, next week here in uh, the Smithsonian, we are, uh, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of deploy of the Hubble Space Telescope. I was not in a mission that carried it up, but I was in the communication. I was the com Capcom to do that. Well, along the way, we put the wrong mirror in the telescope. I had never planned on putting the wrong mirror in the telescope. I didn't plan I got to do something about that. So now I got a mission that got 13 broke systems. So now I can concentrate on this mission, design a mission to fix 13 things. So we do play in the water. It gives us three-dimensional freedom, somewhat like a zero-G. The geometry be able to move stuff around. It's not perfect, though, because you go upside down the water tank, you're carrying all your weight on your shoulders. So the suit does not work in the water the way it's going to work out there in space. So the divers hang all the weights on you so you don't sink to the bottom of the pool or rise to the top. So that's me uh, practicing on the Hubble telescope. Computer graphics to tell that theater. It's like the dance you're going to do out there. There's an American engineer taking a shower in Munich, Germany. He taking a shower in Germany. Now in the U.S., you can change the stream of the shower and you can point the shower. But in, in Europe, you can take the shower ahead and move it around. He's not used to that. He's taking the shower and he says, that's the way I'm going to fix Hubble. His name was James Crocker and this is the way we fix for the wrong mirror. So that goes into the stream of light coming down from the secondary mirror and that mirror corrects it and sends it to another mirror which goes to another instrument. So by putting in one box like this, I was able to correct the light for five other instruments. Here is your Smithsonian and this is down, right downstairs, the engineering qualification unit. Now the Hubble up there, I'm worried about the, the mock-ups I have. This thing guaranteed to have same measurements I trained in the Smithsonian Museum. So I took this, I took that magnetometer and it measures the Earth magnetic field and I installed it on the one downstairs. So I trained in the Smithsonian Museum. I trained it, got it on real kinds of hardware. I'm going to do thermal vacuum tomorrow. That is to go in a vacuum chamber at the anticipated flight temperatures. Very rapidly, flight temperature means you want Mother Earth. Because Earth on average 59 degrees. You got winter, summer, day, night. On Earth, average is 59 degrees. And even from 400 miles up there, your suit's going to be 59 a great temperature. But Hubble's so complicated. The mission's so complicated. When I'm working on Hubble, the sunlight can not get in any, in, in any open door. And so the per person pointing, trying to point the show, I've got a difficult time, and the people stealing gas. This guy's hanging on the guy. I, I want to get home, too, but I need the gas. He's saying we're going to maintain the same attitude to the whole mission, so they won't give me, they will not give me a Mother Earth. And so the test was exact done correctly. They made me run at minus 170 Fahrenheit. I told them it's not going to work. And it sunk so bad during the test, at the eight-hour point, my hands got comfortable. I felt okay. Hey, story, wake up. Your physician, you know what? Hands felt all right because they're dead. So that's your lead spacewalker. That's your lead me. Your lead, your lead mechanic on Hubble six months before flight. Eight dead fingers. And so, but I got to keep going, right? I keep going. I get back in a suit. Story, you can't get in a suit with that kind of hand. Why not? You're going to lose too much flesh. I don't give a damn. I'll shorten the gloves, okay? I keep going. <laughs> don't you forget, I'm a product of child labor and I'm a teenage Marine. So you keep going, okay? <laughs> Here we are, going fix Hubble. 
and this amateur photographer, he lives down there. It's uh, maybe the most beautiful lunch I got. We go fix that thing. I got this kind of pressure from the Congress and all kinds of people, but I got a good plan. I'm happy with a plan, okay? So we go forward. <clears throat> and Mr. Strong, I love and adore these people. I just love and adore them. I want them over my shoulder. I want to help me all the time. Sue Raynor, the leader changes. She behind us. Okay, we go to work out there. There's me arranging my tools for a day's work over South Australia, Kangaroo Island, Cape York, Peninsula. It's just gorgeous. We had to leave the solar rays out there. It's supposed to roll it up like a blanket, but it's broke. So KT just dropped it off and left it out there. What's the problem with the solar rays? They shook so bad we lost 30 minutes of point in every rev. What's wrong with the solar rays? They didn't test them in the sun. You know, solar rays, you got to test in the sun. Okay. <clears throat> And this is downstairs, folks. That's CoStar. It's downstairs. So that little bench from the Munich shower, it comes out here. That's downstairs. So in Smithsonian, that's downstairs. That's KT. And here's Jeff Hoffman holding the Whitefield Planetary Camera. That's downstairs, too. That's the one we, and that's, it had a correction in it. You will find that right downstairs, right outside of this theater. Hanging on with the toes. That's not by accident. I worked that out. I worked that dance out. I went to close these doors. That latch, four inches higher than that latch. I just you know, and they said, I asked him, well, what, what, what's the door? So I got back on the ground and said, we couldn't close them on the ground either. We had to have a, <laughs> we had to have an alignment rig, but that's okay. It's an incredible triumph. We had so few surprises. 40 hours of spacewalking and no surprises. We hand that to the team. So the solar, new, solar ray wouldn't come down. Ratchet range took care of that. So we're talking to President Clinton. It's sadness and melancholy. I lost my baby. I don't come for the victory. I come for the adventure. I come for the journey. I didn't come for the victory, but I lost my baby. I know I'm not getting back. So that's that. Here's before I fix it, and that's after I fix it, right there. Uh, so, and here's the space station. I did for, for two years was a single point of contract to help design that. So I'm going to hand that over to those folks. Thank you so much for coming out here, and thank you so much for being a great audience. Okay. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so it's it's always hard to follow a legend, <clears throat> and um, this is no different. I, I, I'll tell you what, to be able to speak after the guy who did the first shell spacewalk is amazing, but after that performance, I'm not sure I have anything to add. <laughs> anyway, I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Lanius and Dr. Neal for having um, me and, and the rest of us speak here. Um, I think it's important that we recognize um, things in our space history that, that we've done well. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in Russia a couple months ago when they celebrated the 50th anniversary that Story spoke about <clears throat> with Alexei Leonov who is still around and um, it, you know, those folks we can argue about whose approach to space flight is better, theirs or ours, but I think one thing they do a lot better than us is they have a lot of tradition. And it's great that we're, you know, latching onto that idea to, to have this 50th celebration. So um, just quickly, and I'm, I apologize, I, one thing that you know, I was commenting a story about is when, you, um, when, when you're an astronaut, when you get there, you'll do anything, you'll raise your hand anytime ask for volunteers, you do that. And after about five or ten years, you know, you let the new guys do it. So the last thing I expected was the story have the slides and the rest of us be slouching and just talking, but um, that's what happened. <laughs> So as Valerie mentioned, uh, my path w to the astronaut office is pretty straightforward if there is such a thing. Um, I went to the Naval Academy, went to flight school, went to test pilot school, went to graduate school, and got hit, picked up by NASA. My first flight was on Columbia. Uh, we had It was a, a space lab mission. We had no spacewalk scheduled. The next one was on Discovery. And just let me take a step back and talk about ISS assembly. So over the course of probably 13 years and um, 50 plus shuttle flights, as well as a few other launches, we built a space station piece by piece. So we took modules or elements that were designed, constructed, tested on all parts of the globe using different languages, different alphabets, put them in something, launched it into space and tried to connect them. And the amazing thing is it all worked. The way it worked with the shuttle generally is we take we would um, put whatever the element was in the payload bay, launch to orbit, do a rendezvous and docking two days later, 
take whatever it was out of the payload bay with the robotic arm, either attach it directly or hand it off to the station's robotic arm if it existed, and then it would attach it. And they usually would do somewhere between one, two, three, or even four spacewalks to configure that element, which means connecting fluid lines, hydraulic lines, uh, electrical connectors, releasing launch locks, etc. So that happened um, starting in 1998. And in 2000, um, I flew my first mission, to, I did my first spacewalks on my second mission. So our elements that we brought up were the Z1 truss and P the pressurized mating adapter number three. The space station was unmanned at that time, so basically we just got there, uh, did all of our spacewalks out of the space shuttle's airlock. There are four of them, two teams of two people installed both of these elements, did the connections, and came home. And about two weeks later, not even, the first crew launched from Baikonur, and the ISS has been permanently inhabited ever since. So about two years later, I went back to the station on ISS, uh, I mean on Endeavour, sorry. And uh, our cargo that time was not, um, not only an element, but actually a crew. So we brought the fifth uh, expedition home, having brought the sixth expedition up there. So we had three people that flew up with us and three other people that came home. But we also had in our payload bay another external truss element called P1. Uh, we installed it using a robotic arm, and then my partner John Harrington and I did three spacewalks. And then finally, my last mission was up and down on Soyuz to the ISS as a commander of Expedition 14. I did five spacewalks, three of them with Sunny in the uh, American spacesuit out of the shuttle airlock, and also two with my Russian cosmonaut partner out of the uh, Russian airlock um, using the Russian suit. <coughs> so maybe a couple words about the differences um, and a story on the um, the shuttle airlock and the station airlock, at least the crew lock portion of the station airlock, which is actually what gets to pressurize when we go to vac uh, when we're w goes to vacuum when we're going to go outside, are roughly the same dimension. You know, it's about I don't know six feet or so in diameter. We put two people in there usually, um, one heads up and one heads down. Uh, the hatch is in a little bit different place in the two, but um, it's fairly similar. The Russian space lock is a, uh, airlock is a little bit different. So they had a problem on Mir where they um, actually had a, a hatch fail because it opened, it, the hatch opened out. And there was a delta pressure when they um, opened the hatch, there was too much, and when it opened, it actually swung and damaged it, and they, had, they couldn't repressurize the airlock when they came back in. So they started to adopt a U.S. design, which is where the ha hatch opens in, which makes a lot of sense. So on my first um, Russian suit spacewalk, it was my job to open the hatch. And it's a great big hatch. I mean, it's really quite large, and it has a hinge. And so we wait until the pressure gauge reads zero, and then you uh, use sort of like a crowbar apparatus to, you know, to pry it open and get whatever little delta pressure is left. And so I did that, and I could actually see, you know, through the opening, and you could see dust particles and everything flying out. And you're supposed to wait, I don't remember, but it was an inordinate amount of time, let's say a minute or so, with that crowbar in place, just waiting for it to equalize. But it's pretty clear to me that it was equalized after no time at all, or so I thought. <laughs> so I tried to open the hatch, and I couldn't. And I, I was sure that the, del that the pressure had been equalized because I had seen space through there. I mean, how long does it take to get the last molecules out? Well, it turns out it takes a long time. <laughs> we had plans in place to, if there was a hatch failure, they had plans where they could override the hinges and actually basically pull the pins out of the hinges and take um, the hatch off that way. Thank God we didn't get down that path very far. We figured out what had gone wrong. And we went on and did the spacewalk. Um, my second story, well, I have a lot of stories, is also on that very same spacewalk. Um, and this was the most tense moment of, of the 10 EVAs that I've had and however many hours that was. This is the most tense moment. So the, the task, Russian spacewalks um, were not so much about construction. They were usually to install or remove or reconfigure payloads. So. There's an element in the periodic table of elements called uh, scandium. Anybody ever heard of it? I, really? Well, it turns out you can make a golf club out of scandium. And um, a company did that, and they gave it to the Russian Space Agency to fly on the ISS. And they were going to um, take a picture of somebody hitting a golf ball with a golf club, which you can buy on eBay for a million dollars right now, by the way. 
So that was our payload. NASA was not happy about a NASA astronaut participating was effectively a commercial, but they did it because somehow the Russians called it a payload. So the other detail here is that the ball was not actually a golf ball, it was a ping pong ball, because they'd done a lot of analysis saying that if you, you know, it, it could recontact in an orbit or two, and probably wisely they made him hit a, a ping pong ball. But it was my job to put the ping pong ball on the tee. And the tee, of course, it didn't just stay there, it was actually a conical spring. So imagine this conical spring. I take the ping pong ball out of my pocket. Everything in space is tethered from, I mean, every tool, every nut, every widget is tethered. And this had a little tether on it. It was a little string, it looked like thread, with about a one centimeter square piece of tape that held it on there. Well, they didn't do the thermal vac testing on the piece of tape, and it gave way in about that long. So I'm holding this ping pong ball in my 5.8 PSI pressurized gloves, trying to wedge it into this thing, and I was sure, I mean, you know what a ping pong ball is like, if you squeeze too hard and not on center, it's gonna go take off. Anyway, it all worked out. I hit, I held Misha's um, legs while he hit the golf ball, and, and as I see, I never saw it, but I hear he shanked it big time. <laughs> And the last story I'll tell, <clears throat> which is actually a, a beautiful story, um, the most beautiful moment that I can recall EVA. On uh, the second spacewalk on Discovery, um, we were going to test the SAFER. So the SAFER is a poor man's MMU. MMU is man maneuvering unit. It's what they used on a couple of occasions to actually go out from the shuttle and, and grab a wayward satellite. Um, it was very expensive to operate and it was uh, done away with I think in the post Challenger time frame but when you we used to do spacewalks out of the shuttle before there was a space station if by some chance the, the tether that we are always attached to the shuttle with which is you know a quarter inch wow, um, steel braided cable could come loose or break or whatever the commander would say great and he'd grab the controls of the shuttle and go get you well, when you're docked to the space station, you can't very well do that because there's a lot of drag that you're pulling around there. So we developed this thing to be able to self-save ourselves. So SAFER stands for Simplified Aid for EVA Rescue. And it's basically a little jet pack that attaches to the portable life support system backpack. And if by some chance you were to be um, lost, you could deploy a hand controller. It had 24 nitrogen coal gas thrusters that would um, actually, first of all, stop your rotation as soon as you turned it on. And then if you were lucky enough to be looking at the station, you would pulse your way back to the station. And if not, you'd rotate around until you saw it, and then you'd pulse your way. So that sounds a little easier than it is. And we would practice this in the virtual reality lab. So we would work Don goggles. We could see our hands and they would cast us off at these ridiculous tumble rates and separation velocities and we'd have to figure out a way to get back. Limited prop, propellant, limited battery life and you had to pass this before you were certified to go EVA. So the purpose of this test was to determine how accurately that virtual reality experience mimicked the real life. So the setup was my partner and I, one person would be in, in with his feet in a portable re foot restraint on the end of the robotic arm, which would be taken as far as away as it could get from the space shuttle, holding the other person, and then they would sort of let them go, back away, and the person would deploy the hand controller, do some maneuvering, and then fly back to the payload bay. So um, my partner went first, Jeff Weissoff, I held him, and it just turned out that he did his flight, um, his flight, his test at night, in orbital night, so behind, on the other side of the Earth from the sun. When I did it, um, it happened to be daytime, and we were filming a um, movie that's been shown in this very theater called IMAX um, Space Station 3D. And there was a, so there's an IMAX camera in the payload bay looking up at us, but we had to wait for certain lighting conditions. So the bottom line is we were all ready to go with Jeff holding me now with his feet in the foot restraint, but we had to wait for the, for the sun to be in a certain position. I'm not talking long, but five minutes. People always say, what's the view like? To be honest with you, it's really hard to take the time to take a look at what's going on because you really feel pressure to get the job done. There's a huge team on the ground, you know, looking at checklists, following every move you make, and you, you don't want to let them down. So you, you sneak a peek once in a while, but this was different because we had to kill five minutes of time. We happened to be coming up over Central America, southwest to northeast. The sun was... <clears throat> still in the morning sky but you know fairly close I mean fairly high 
and to see the Caribbean from that perspective with the shuttle between me and it with the blues uh, I think these will both attest that how pretty I mean that that water is unbelievably beautiful the the turquoise aqua colors from space and I just remember the serenity and the peacefulness of the moment so with that I'll turn it over to my partner Stan. Thanks, Doris. Thanks, LA. Um, these are some giants that I uh, get to stand on the shoulders of and uh, and be in the space program today. So thanks for setting the stage and al allowing me to actually get out there and do a couple spacewalks. And so I think I'd like to share a couple things about spacewalking because it seems all glamorous and cool, doesn't it? You know, um, but usually things go wrong. And I was I didn't know that, so I'm letting you in on a little secret. Um, I was wondering, uh, you know, when I went out there for my first spacewalk. I'm all excited and uh, you know how am I gonna you know am I gonna do everything right and it's a lot of pressure to get out there and do it just like LA says you know you have a lot of people counting on you this is it's very expensive to take the time to get out there and do something pretty serious and on my first flight uh, like mentioned by LA we were in the middle of construction of this uh, space station so it was actually um, STS-116 and I was went out the door for the first time with Bob Kerbeam who happens to be also another Naval Academy graduate and we're out there doing our thing and I'm getting ready to take a couple pictures of, of Beamer and then I'm trying to get back into the uh, robotic arm and then uh, the guy inside the shuttle goes hey Sonny does your tether is your camera tethered and I look down and I see no camera and I'm like no <laughs> um, it wasn't anymore the tether was still there the little bolts had come out and I was like darn it <laughs> and uh, so that's the f that's like in the first two hours and I'm like you know just l shake it off shake it off you're done it's okay you, you, you know just move on keep going and so then um, w on that spacewalk we actually happened to get everything beside for the losing the camera done pretty quick and so we had a little extra time and uh, we had a little bit of a problem retracting a solar array from the space station because we were actually getting ready to fold it up like a map LA was inside at the time and uh, and then we fold it up and then we would move it out uh, to uh, the port side of the space station a little bit later but as they were trying to just fold it with a button command it wouldn't fold it's got a little hung up so they said hey I got an idea why don't you guys go out to the top of the solar array and shake it a little bit like a map and see if you can fix those those little wrinkles and uh, and we start climbing up the top of the, the space station to this solar array up there and you know Beamer I don't know if you guys have any knowledge of who this guy is but he's sort of looks like story or actually look like story for sure in that picture <laughs> anyway uh, a pretty big guy so we get up to the top of the solar array and beamers on one side I'm on the other side beamer shakes this thing and his his part of the solar array works like a charm and then it's like Sonny it's your turn and by the way don't hit it with any more don't shake it with any more than like 55 pounds so I'm shaking this thing, nothing's happening. I'm like, oh my God, I'm the wimpy girl. I can't believe it. So I'm shaking the crap out of this thing. And, and uh, you know, they're like, okay, never mind. Just now come in. And, I, you know, of course you get that feeling of defeat. And then afterwards, I actually saw a video of it and I was really shaking the crap out of it. And it, did, and it wasn't retracting. That, so it was semi my fault. So anyway, that's, that was just like my first spacewalk. And I'm like, oh, it, you, know, uh, you know, that's just the get the dust off. You can, this will, this, you know, they'll all be fine after after that every spacewalk will just go absolutely as planned and LA and I had trained for our spacewalks for a number of years and so we knew what we were doing again in the middle of the construction of the space station um, changing the heating and cooling um, parts of the space station uh, the easiest thing get out there undo a couple bolts take a little frame off of where the uh, cooling lines are because we're gonna get ready to do something really hard um, move these things which are you know filled with pressure and you have to sort of turn them off all the way around and you know my job is just a little zh, 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 get it done and I try to take this thing off it's stuck I'm like I can't believe this what's wrong with me so we have another tool which is absolutely not to be used for anything except for prying and uh, and I have a good role model here who's taught me a little innovation I couldn't get that thing off so I'm like is anybody looking? Well, of course everybody's looking, but for some reason I thought nobody was looking, right? And you have helmet cams right here. So I take this thing, whack, 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 and luckily it comes off. I'm like, okay, <sighs> we're out of that one. And then we actually, that spacewalk ended up being a little bit long, again, because of things that are just, 
Um, a little tricky, a little frozen, a little hot, a, a little not like they are on the ground. And I mean, these are really good lessons learned that I took away like, um, one of the things LA's Commander Brian Kelly always said, go look at the real hardware if you can. Well, it's starting to get harder and harder and harder as our space flights went along. And then later on, my second flight, because none of the hardware is on the ground anymore. And so then you just sort of have to look at mock-ups of it and have a pretty good idea, general guess of how this stuff is, is going to work uh, based on the engineers that maybe designed it 20 years ago, if you can find them. Um, so fast forward to my second flight, uh, and you, some folks might have heard about this story. We changed out essentially a humongous circuit breaker box, a MBSU main bus switching unit, um, and we thought, oh, we've, we all practiced this. This is one of the top ten things that can go wrong with the space station, so we all have to know how to do these fairly simple things out in space and just go out and, and change that box. There's a new one waiting for you right there, brand new, should work, no problem. So of course, I should know better, right? Uh, so we go out there, we undo this box, and it seemed a little bit tricky to get it off. And then we're trying to put the new box in, and um, we end up sort of uh, uh, not threading the bolts in quite correctly. Um, so no big deal. This is one of those times where you have a little bit of time to actually see uh, the Earth go by. Uh, about eight hours later, with about ten trips to the airlock, back and forth, getting all sorts of tools, uh, we finally decided that we didn't really have the appropriate tools to fix the threads on this bolt and maybe we're going to give it up for a night. Um, and so I thought to myself, really? Again? 116? Expedition 14? <laughs> Expedition 33? 32? 33? Does this happen to everybody or is it, am I just bad luck? Um, so we go back in and we end up, of course, there's no Home Depot, no Ace Hardware <laughs> up in space and so you have to be a little in um, inventive, uh, innovative, right? And uh, so you come up with some interesting tools. And uh, I, my husband, who's an avid tool and die guy, um, I was talking to him on the phone, and I said, you know, I don't have a lot of time. We're gonna actually going to get out, go out, and do another spacewalk because we've got to replace the circuit breaker box. And he's like, what kinds of things are you doing? I'm like, well, I got this toothbrush. And he's like, wait a minute, say it again. You got a toothbrush? And like, we got a toothbrush, and we're we're tethering it to uh, you know this bar, and we got. Um, another bolt that we got off another box that we're gonna he's like you're essentially making a tap and die out of a toothbrush and an old bolt and I'll make yeah he's like how much taxpayer dollar do I pay to this program <laughs> and I was like I know I know but we don't have ace hardware we've got to get it done we need this power for one of the solar rays so um, I mean with a lot of uh, and I say all of this with a little jest but with a really a lot of amazing <coughs> folks on the ground who came up with the you know MacGyvered it essentially with the things that you really need to get something done, to get the box fixed. And it happened, like I mentioned, a number of times when LA and I were out also with amazing people who come up with uh, great ideas of how just to get the job done. And I think there was probably evidenced um, also more recently in the spacewalk with Chris Cassidy and Luca Parmitano, where they had actually a leak in the suit. These suits are awesome. And every time I came inside, I hugged my suit because it keeps you alive. Um, but they are getting old. Uh, you know, and we need to actually come up with uh, newer suits for the next generation of folks who are going to do spacewalks. It's amazing how much we can do with these space suits. I mean, it's amazing the beginning parts of spacewalks, how um, slightly limited they were, and now how amazing the things that we can do go out to the space station, you know, essentially translate a whole soccer field away from where you, you left and work on things with extended robotic arms um, out on your own. It's pretty, it's pretty pretty great, but we need an, the next generation of spacesuits so we can go and take that next step forward. So with that, I can't wait to be part of that, and I just wanted to say again thank you to the, the giants that uh, shoulders I get to stand on.
Well, thank you all for giving us insight into your experiences and story, uh, especially to you for giving us insight into the history of EVA. And I'm glad you touched on the fact that EVA has really evolved in 50 years from those first tentative steps out uh, to doing very sophisticated work in space now. Um, one question I've always wondered about is this. Uh, all of the new astronaut candidates and uh, newly minted astronauts go through some exposure to EVA training. Right, everybody gets a turn in the pool and, and a chance to try on a suit and that sort of thing. What actually makes um, an EVA specialist? Um, what kinds of skills and abilities are, are you being watched the whole time and evaluated and uh, you're selected or do you get to raise your hand and say, I want to be an EVA specialist? How does that work? Well, I think um, it's certainly evolved over time, and uh, you know, Story can talk better about how it was in the beginning. Um, and Sunny, you know, now with the advent of having EVA skills programs, so you know, I don't remember the rate, but back in the <coughs> '90s, um, before the beginning of EVA, uh, sorry, before the beginning of ISS construction, we were doing two, four EVAs a year, maybe. And then we were doing two or more per flight, you know. So I mean, they called us the wall of EVA. So as we approached um, the construction of ISS, it became clear that we really had to sort of step up our game. Um, and and I remember when I was, you know, so when Story was about to leave the office and I was sort of getting my feet wet, uh, we talked about the EVA mafia, and you sort of had to figure <laughs> out how you were going to get in to the EVA mafia. And I think it was done by reputation. You know, Story, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but people. Would you would do these? You would absolutely be evaluated in the pool. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I think the, the basic mechanical skills uh, that that helps a whole bunch. And people that were uh, I always had eight hours with the, every new class that came in to just give them a philosophy of what uh, a spacewalking was about. And so anyone that had a trouble in, uh, unfortunately, they just threw people in a tank and in a suit and and had them try to do things and it didn't go well. If I just had an hour or two with them, I could I could smooth all that kind of stuff out. And so the basic thing is, is a suit is not the same body you got. It doesn't have a shoulder joint and it works very different and it's it's bulky and uh, you got different joints than you got. And so the important thing is to understand that when, when I want to reach out and touch something, I got no difficulty. This is, this is, this is unconscious. And if I want to touch my nose, you know, I don't have to think about touching my nose. If you're in a suit and you go to touch your nose, you miss. <laughs> Because, you know, you put in all the same memory and the forces you've done for 40, 50, 60 years, and this works. In a suit, it doesn't work. For First of all, you're not carrying as opposed to gravity. And first of all, the, suit, the forces in the suit are different. And so, but for just one point for all of you, when you want to reach out and touch, you have to error correct. So I would tell people, don't just reach out like you're going to get there, because you're not going to get there. You're going to miss. And that is to watch your finger go exactly to the point and it'll get off course but watch it until you're there and so that's the critical things to understand it's not the old body you used to have so you error correct and you get there when you've done that enough times you have a person like this in clothes like this and that's the unconscious that you've learned forever when you get in a suit now you have a different mode and after a while you get so you can do this in a suit without thinking about it so I think that's the, the basic uh, philosophy of suited work the other critical thing is the thing we had to learn back in Germany and that is to restrain yourself in a way so whatever force you impose on the work you need to do the reaction is going to come back and the same force will be imposed to you so you have to be ready to counter that and thank goodness for handrails and foot restraints and uh, tethers and other crew aids right yeah. and I would agree it's a, a lot of repetition that just helps because uh, you know, it's a little bit strange to get used to Maybe this will be work a better. I think it's a little bit used, weird to get used to it, so a little bit of repetition just so you get familiar with the suit and how the suit works 
and how the how you're going to do the tasks. But I think one of the major mottos that we have is slower is faster, and it sort of goes with the action reaction point that story brings up. Um, and you find that when you go too fast, you work too fast in the suit, you're going to make mistakes. And so if you're a little bit slower, a little bit more precise, a little bit more intentioned on how you're going to actually move in the suit, that's going to help you a lot. Yeah, it's great imagination. It's like a, it's like being a ballerina. It's like being a figure skater. I did train with Dorothy Hamill on how you do spacewalks because you know, Dorothy got her passion. You know what you're good at. Not good. She converges on the final solution, and in the final solution, she repetitively practices that. So when the music starts, you're going to win the gold, and that's what a spacewalk is like. And so the body's going to do the job out there. So in your imagination, you see yourself doing that whole theater, that whole dance. Now, for the most part, in uh, in the shuttle and in spaceflight, you have a simulator. We do have water, and we do have other analog devices, but it's not exactly like a spacewalk. So unfortunately, you have to think about the differences between how you're practicing and what the real world is going to be like. In the water tank, your suit does not behave like it will out there. Out there, your suit floats, and you float inside your suit. There's hardly any contact, and you make the right contact. You need to get the job done. If you go upside down the water tank, you've got 170 pounds on your collarbones and the suit doesn't work like it's going to work. So that's the difference between spacewalk and we don't have a great simulator. A uh, related question then, you're talking about it being like a ballet. Uh, I know on the missions you have a choreographer and you have a remote manipulator system arm operator who are key members of your EVA team. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the relationship with those other two team members? It's not just you all out there doing this on your own, right? Um. Sure, and it's even more important today um, because we don't necessarily, sort of like I was mentioning that all that hardware is not on the ground, we don't always get a chance to one, see it, or even because we're sometimes nowadays fixing stuff rather than adding things on, or even get to really practice what we're going to do um, before we get into space. So we really take advantage of the virtual reality um, laboratory that provides graphics for what we're going to do, but you sort of rely on your IV, the guy who's sitting in mission control who's actually telling you the steps. You're familiar with it, but all the specifics, particulars of what are the settings for the, essentially the drill you're going to use, um, or, you know, like what is the accurate number of times or torque that you have to put on a certain bolt or something like that, that the IV guy is going to do that. Um, likewise, the guy who's driving the robotic arm, he's key. You know, you don't want him driving your head into the space station, so there's a real good uh, choreography and coordination between the two of it. How you, sim some, simple things, just terminology. How are you going to say if I want p specifically to pitch myself or if I want to use the station coordinates? So your even your coordinate system has to be um, uh, decided on and discussed between the two of you beforehand. So you know each other. You practically almost know each other. how each other is going to think um, by practicing and talking to each other, working through some of these things before the spacewalks themselves. I would add. I would add that the, um, you know, we especially during the construction phase, we were really able to choreograph these things very accurately, and because we knew sort of what we were going to do, we could actually look at the hardware, we could put our hands on it while it was still on the ground, <clears throat> in most cases, and. Um, we would have not just the EVA crew members, but the IV crew member who sometimes is on the ground. Back then, it was often on board the shuttle or the station, robotic arm operator, etc. But there's a huge team of ground controllers that are involved with this, and I mean, they do everything. As Sunny was mentioning, to tell you sort of real time what the torque setting might be on a pistol grip tool setting. But even before that, long before that, and just developing the procedures of how we're going to get to point A to point B, when we're going to switch tethers, all kinds kinds of really complicated things. Of course, as I think it was Eisenhower said, a plan is the most important thing, but it's not worth anything. In other words, you got to have a plan, but once you start getting the battlefield, the plan goes out the window. And she, as she mentioned, things almost always don't go exactly according to plan, and that's where the ground team really can be helpful because they have the uh, the ability to get their eyes on assets about you know about what details of the technical design that we could never dream of. So it's a really big team effort the whole time. 
and as Capcom on so many missions, you were that interface between that big team and the crew, right? I were you love, essentially choreographing? I adore Mission Control. Yeah. <laughs> I love those folks. And people ought to, used to talk about me. Story's a great spacewalker. But he got one big problem, he mumbles all the time. <laughs> well, the mumbling I'm doing is to talk about how it's going now and where it goes next. What that does is, is keep mission control with me. Believe me, I want to help. So I was a Capcom in 25 missions, but in a way it's their mission, and you're the hands and their eyes out there. And so you want them there with you, so you try to keep them on board as to where you are and how it goes so that they can help you. And that's true of the totality, not just spacewalking, but the entire flight. And so the real R of a mission is to stay in total touch with mission control and, and work like that team. Well, I'm sure there are some questions in the audience, so uh, if you will raise your hand and speak loudly, I will try to acknowledge you. I saw your hand first, so. Thank you. Um, first, thank each one of you for sharing your personal experiences so intimately with all of us. Um, my question is this. Um, I believe Story mentioned that the suits are pressurized in somewhere around 5 PSI or something, about a third of the normal atmosphere. Um, do you, are you able to train for that on the ground first, and then once you get up there, what kind of physical effects does having low pressure have on you? I'll repeat the question for our recording then. Uh, essentially it is, um, since you're operating in a suit pressure that's lower than you're accustomed to here on the ground, are you able to train effectively on the ground for that lower pressure? And uh, do you feel certain effects of it when you don the suit in space? And I think he directed it uh, first to you, Story. Me? Mm -hmm. Me? Um, I have no experience, L.A., so your Russian suit is running at about 5? Uh, the Russian suit's at 5.8. Okay, US I have no experience at 5.8. But is the Delta P across the suit that affects uh, uh, how, how you're going to work? And I don't think that's major. So we, we do get a lot of vacuum experience. We get vacuum experience in the real suit that we're going to fly. It's interesting in the water tank, and when you're upright like this, that takes 30 feet of water is equal to four, 15 PSI. So if you're upright like that, you get more Delta P across the suit, you know, up here than, than down there. But none of that is, none of that is, uh, is essential. So the Delta P does affect the mobility of the suit, but it's physiologically and emotionally, it's not something you really feel. But the suit you wear in space is a lot tougher. Man, I used to fight like heck to get a high time suit. And so when I could get a 15 or 20 hour suit, I says, man, that's great. But when I go look at the darn thing in space they gave me, it's only a 12 hour suit. And so it's like, it's like wearing in a pair of shoes. The suit you get up there, the glove in the water tank, has, it's got a thousand hours on it. It's lubricated by water and it's absolutely fantastic. The doggone glove they give me up there has only got 10 or 12 hours on it. And it's just, as soon as you depressurize the airlock around, you say, oh my goodness is how horrible and you go from there <laughs> would uh, you like just, to elaborate on that yeah well not on that. <laughs> I, I do agree though that the suits we wear in the water are much uh, more pliable than the, than the flight suits for sure but I was going to pull on this the part of the question about training and physiologically I mean you know being um, going to lower pressure is a bit like a diver coming out of the water, coming to the surface. And so when we're doing um, operations in the pool, which is you know up to 40 feet deep, plus another third of an atmosphere on top of that, you're at a relatively high pressure, and we're down there for about six hours. So you couldn't, you couldn't breathe normal air for that long under that much pressure and come to the surface without some kind of decompression. So what we do is uh, we breathe nitrox, a, a combination of nitrogen and oxygen. In the case of the NBL, I think it's 45% oxygen, which is obviously a, a lot richer. And that prevents us from getting this decompression sickness, uh, bubbles coming out of saturation. Yes. You mentioned 
You mentioned the difference between the uh, Russian and the United States suits. Could you elaborate a little bit on the differences? The good, the bad? Uh, the question is to elaborate on the differences between the uh, U.S. suit, the extravehicular mobility unit, and the Russian suit, the Orlan. Sure. Um, so there are advantages and disadvantages to both. First of all, I mean, just from the, the most basic, the uh, U.S. suit has uh, different pieces. It has sort of pants, the lower torso assembly, which are the pants and the boots. It's kind of like PJ booties are already integrated. You put those on first after you put the undergarment on. Then you put on the hard upper torso. Then you put on gloves, and then you put on the helmet. Um, the Russian suit has it's all attached. It has a backpack that swings open like a door and you stick your feet in there And then your arms and your head at the same time and then you close the door and you're in so from a don donning and doffing perspective It's uh, quite a bit simpler Another advantage is that it's at, it operates at 5.8 psi So the the issue that I mentioned about decompression sickness is an is a factor for the EMU because we have to have some kind of time to uh, get the nitrogen out of our blood and we can do that a number of ways we can actually just breathe o2 in the suit but that takes four hours and it's obviously a waste of time we can do an exercise protocol where we are breathing 100 percent oxygen while we're exercising because that basically accelerates the process or what i think is a preferred method now is we do what they call camp out so we isolate the airlock from the rest of the station and we reduce the pressure to about two-thirds of an atmosphere instead of a full atmosphere and we sleep there overnight and then when they reopen that thing we're wearing a mask so we're always breathing 100 percent oxygen so from that perspective or those two perspectives i guess the russian suit is superior and it's also more comfortable i'd say on the other side it is far less mobile. The U.S. suit, particularly the gloves, are unbelievably um, dexterous. You can do amazing things. This issue with the ping pong ball would not have been a big deal in a U.S. suit. It was much harder in a Russian suit. Um, it's also, um, it's a little bit the difference between driving a sports car and a minivan. The, the EMU, it fits you a lot better. It's, um, you feel like it's part of you. I, I mean, what Story says is absolutely true, but an Orlon, you're sort of swimming in it. It really is one side fits all with just a few uh, leg uh, length extensions for the arms and legs so it's it's a little bit more cumbersome it's you know it's sort of just uh, the basic model whereas the um, the is like a Ferrari that's a great analogy um, is there a question in the middle uh, yes you uh, in 1996 I was lucky enough to meet uh, Mr. L.A. as part of the PR event in advance the launch Now that you've had all these experiences, you know, for the panel, what would you go back and tell that person, uh, you know, before your first launch, about what you got right, what you got wrong, and, and what what would you have missed when you were trying to start that process? What lessons learned would you share with the novices before their first spacewalks? Uh, I think I would say prepare to get a lot wrong, and that's okay. Just learn from it. <laughs> Yeah, I'd, I'd say the same. I mean, I, if anything, I think um, try to enjoy it a little bit instead of being so worried about, you know. We, we, do, we do try to pass that on. I remember seeing Story uh, in quarantine when he was before going great getting ready to launch and he was lying down lying on his bed with his the bed was tilted so that the head was six or eight inches lower than his feet <laughs> and I asked him why he was doing that and he said because that's what it's going to feel like when I get into space because all the blood is going to because of the lack of gravity rushed to my head so pretty important tidbit and what advice or lesson learned would you share Story? <laughs> Uh, just enjoy the ride, as I'll be sure. Um, it's very easy to be a parallel processor and get the work done at the same time. Uh, step outside of yourself and watch yourself work and, and, and watch the world go around. But it, it's a ballet, it's a dance, it's an adventure, it's a journey, and you just you deal with all the details along the way so that you hope not to be surprised. Yes. Uh, once you put on these space suits, how, how heavy is it? How heavy? Yeah, how, 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 how it was, I'm sure it was very heavy. How did it feel like it? Feel like, right? How heavy is the spacesuit yeah. and how, how does it feel? Yeah, like, 
be, be, be able to walk while you're in, 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 the sh in the shuttle. Okay. Do you feel the mass of the spacesuit when you're in space? Does it, does it, um, I guess, hinder you in any way in terms of your mobility? I think you're prepared for it pretty well because you have to train on Earth first and foremost and you can definitely feel the weight of the suit on Earth even though it is uh, neutrally buoyant in the pool with the weights uh, and, the, and the buoyancy of the suit itself. So you're prepared for what the suit is and you do it repetitively sort of like Story m mentioned. Uh, luckily enough we have a lot of time to train that at the pool and so your first time in your suit however it is a little bit stiffer and it's a little bit harder to work in because darn it it's only been used a couple times not not all those numbers of times in the pool so it is a little bit more difficult to use and you feel the mass of it. I think the biggest um, impression that you have is the pool, somewhat what Story mentioned already. The pool, it's uh, you know, sort of easy to uh, easy to stop yourself. In space, it's the opposite. It's easy to get going, but it's really hard to stop yourself. And so, um, usually on your first spacewalk, you do a little bit of an orientation right in the vicinity of the airlock, just to give yourself get yourself calibrated about how you should work and how you should move in the suit. Because you're going to find you're going to start taking off, but then you're going to have to really use a little bit of arm strength or tether strength to stop yourself. So um, that's, I think, the biggest impression that I got on my first spacewalk. Is there anyone high in the upper seats? There's a hand straight up there. Okay, I see someone very near the back row, yes. You mentioned a hot box and cold box. With the subset of the sunrise happening off the space, how does that impact your planning? How does what affect landing, sunrise, sunrise and sunset? Okay, I'll let you answer since you heard it. Well, it's, I mean, it, it um, first of all, from a thermal perspective, the difference between day and night is quite large. You know, it's ish, plus or minus 100 degrees. Um, and amazingly, you don't notice it very much in the suit. So when you go from day to night or night to day, you would think that as, as you're in those temperature changes, you would feel it. But there's a lot of layers of thermal insulation, and so we're actually fairly comfortable. You're far more thermally affected by the level of your work you're doing. So when you work hard, you can get hot really fast. And likewise, if you get hot and you turn this cooling up and you stop working, you can get cold really fast. But the day-night stuff's not so much. I mean, obviously we worry about lights. We have lights on our helmets, and so the ground will give us a heads up before five minutes or so <clears throat> before sunrise or sunset to either you know turn our lights on or put our visors down because the sun is incredibly bright when it comes up. Yes, right here. So, so to follow up on the oxygen question, you know, nitrox and 100% and O2, um, what is the fatigability difference in space versus during your training? Does, in fact, the, uh, the high O2 that I believe is in the spacesuit, it's 100% in order to get the partial pressure in the lungs right? Um, does that lead to reactive oxygen species that might uh, lead to better and faster fatigability during physical exercise? Story I, I was going to say that sounds like a question for story. The, uh -huh. the question is about uh, the uh, effect on fatigue of this different oxygen nitrogen mix. Uh, fabulous a question, and so obviously I understand uh, all the stuff that's going on. But I just got to say that I, I I don't think we notice any of that. We just simply don't notice it, and so I don't I don't notice the difference. And there is a physiological difference in in oxygen, not just the partial pressure, not the only factor. 100% O2, even at the same partial pressure, is toxic. So you obviously understand everything's going on, but I don't think we notice. I don't subjectively notice that thing. Now we did, uh, and Sunny early on we had to do decompression stops. You do a seven in our run on air over at uh, over in Huntsville after you've done a seven hour run it was absolutely horrible you want to get out <laughs> 
and you have to do a decompression stop because they've looked at your your depth and they've run the navy you know the navy tables and you're just trying to get out and you got to stop for decompression but in terms of that's fabulous question but I, I i don't think i've noticed the difference no, I wouldn't say I noticed a difference either, except for the fact that on the space station, of course, you're breathing normal air, and sometimes the CO2 is, well, actually, the CO2 is a little bit higher than it is normally here on Earth, and so that is a, like a, a, an everlasting effect, or a lingering effect, I should put it that way. So, uh, the another impression that I got is after spacewalks, I always felt pretty good, even though I was tired. I felt pretty good because you spent that time breathing 100% O2. Maybe Michael Jackson has something. <laughs> um, well, I think we have time for one more question, and I wonder if there is a woman, a girl, or a student who has a question, because all I've been seeing are hands raised by men. Yes, you. Well, first I want to make a comment. Um, I took my two children, they're seven and nine, to space camp in Huntsville, Alabama, and I recommend it to everyone. <laughs> Absolutely amazing adventure that I had with my children. She recommends space camp for everyone. They were able, they were the two that got picked to do the EVA. So they got to experience the not being able to touch what you're looking at. They had to look at their hands. So I saw that. Question for you, Tori. What particularly are you studying or researching with your free fall um, experiments? Okay, the question is for Story Musgrave. What is he researching with his free fall flights? Uh, You're talking about the, para the parachuting. Parachuting. Yeah. Well, first of all, Huntsville is fan fantastic. And thank you so much for the, the you know, your perspective on, on what the kids will get out of there. So I do teach at Space Camp. I'm there in Huntsville. I'm there five times, five times a year. Just, uh, you know, pointing the kids toward the future. Uh, the free fall. So I got a free fall parachuting by I was the first one to establish the aerodynamics of the free-falling human body. That's the best lifts over drag. In other words, how far you can go in this for every al altitude, for every thousand feet down, and different terminal velocity. So I got into parachuting just because, for Story Musgrave, it was another, it was another environment, another domain to get it right, to get it right the first time and right every time. And so in my progress along from being a farm kid, ex-marine, to uh, the astronaut corps, just getting it right the first time. Uh, parachuting was good for that. But I did take it serious academically. It was, it was a class project. It's in my minor in aeronautical engineering. The class project was establish the aerodynamics of the free-falling human body. We had two recording theodolites, a telescope here, a telescope here. They were synced up by a DC pulsar. They tracked me. We sent a balloon up to cancel out the winds. Get the, and it was IBM card back then. So every 20th of a second, an IBM card and establish the, the aerodynamics of the free-falling body. And even today, so about 40 years later, uh, the data we got way back then in, uh, in 1964 was very close to the, the best data they got today. Thank you. Well, thank you, all three of you. And thank you again to our uh, National Air and Space Society members and guests. We can't do programs like this without you, uh, so we very much appreciate your support. Uh, we also very much appreciate that the three of you made time in your schedules to spend the evening with us. Uh, Story and I are going to be signing a book in the Milestones of Flight area um, as we break up now, and we would ask that all of you leave through the upper level and take the escalators down to the first floor. Uh, thank you again for all your support for the museum.